السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ويوز بيجن وتنين بقول الله وياسه he sends his blessings upon our dear beloved prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله we are continuing in the series and we are now at one of the earlier surahs and it is an extremely eloquent, beautiful surah to listen to, and that is Surat Al-Najm. Surat Al-Najm. Okay? And this surah has a very interesting story. It is actually one of the first, it is the first surah revealed in the Quran um, with a sajda, verse of sajda in it. And there's about 15 or so verses in the Quran that have the sajda in it, sajda tilawa, which is the sujood tilawa, I should say, which is the sujood that you do when you recite a verse that has the commandment uh, of prostrating, mentioning the prostration, sujood. It is revealed after the first migration to Abyssinia. So Abyssinia, uh, where a Najashi was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu permitted some of the Muslims who were facing persecution to find safety in the rule of al-Najashi, who was the Christian king at that time of Abyssinia. And this surah is revealed after the first migration of it. And the second migration will happen because of this surah, actually. So... There's a story of this surah, by the way. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was giving da'wah to, and it was by chance that the tribal leaders that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted to meet, they were all kind of right there, gathered in front of the Kaaba. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he goes and he recites to them this surah, and the sujood tilawa, the 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 recitation sujood is the last ayah of this verse. So the Prophet sallallahu begins to recite this verse. And it's a very beautiful, poetic, rhythmic, amazing surah to listen to. And I highly encourage everyone to listen to it. So the Prophet sallallahu is reciting this surah and he's reciting it so beautifully and powerfully. The verses are hitting the people. And he gets to the last verse, which is the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبَدُوا So do sujood to Allah and worship Him. So the Prophet ﷺ falls into sujood and the power of the Qur'an, the amazement, the, uh, the heart-grabbing, attentive nature of the Qur'an is that all of them, the Quraysh, the disbelievers, everybody listening to the Prophet ﷺ fell down and worshipped to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this started a rumor across Arabia that the Quraysh, the Meccans, had embraced Islam. And so the believers, the Muslims in Abyssinia, who fleed, not because they wanted to, but because they had to, they heard this rumor, and some decided that they would go back to Mecca, go back home. And so they did so, and they come back and they find that the Quraysh did not, in fact, actually convert to Islam. And in fact, they increased their persecution because of how embarrassed they were that they fell for this quote-unquote trick by the Prophet. They were embarrassed that how could they, after listening to the Qur'an, do sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were not Muslim, they were enemies of Islam. And so this increased their persecution levels and made things worse for the Muslims in Mecca. And because of this, this led to the second migration of Abyssinia, which is the more popular one. More famous one because this is where a larger group of believers moved from Mecca to Abyssinia. And so that is when the famous incident of Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and the Najashi, the Christian king, they have that conversation and Surah Maryam is mentioned, etc. However, getting back to this surah, this surah, this is one of the reasons for that rumor to being spread because the Quraysh, after listening to it, they fell down in sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this surah off by swearing, A'udhu billahi shaitan al-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-Najmi idha hawa, by the star when it descends, ma dalla sahibukum wa ma ghawa. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this star and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives testimony to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam testifying to his sanity and his uh, prophethood because the disbelievers were making claims that Muhammad must be crazy, he must be a magician, he must be a madman, he must be all these different types of excuses. They were just throwing everything at the wall trying to find out what would stick. And they knew that the lies that they were saying were lies at the end of the day and that people would see through them. But nevertheless, they tried to make as many things up about the Prophet wasallam as they could. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Your companion Muhammad has neither strayed nor has he erred. And this verse gives the Prophet wasallam a testimony to two things. Number one, he has not strayed, meaning... He is not being misguided. He's not mistaken. Right? Meaning he's not making an error unknowingly, ignorantly, without his knowledge. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Nor has he erred, meaning he has not made a mistake knowingly. So neither knowingly or unknowingly has he made a mistake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testifying to his truthfulness and his prophethood. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى And neither does he say things from his own desires. You people are people of desires. Right? You are people who follow their own whims and desires. He is not like that. So he has not made a mistake. He's not wrong. He's not lying to you. And he is not speaking from his own desires. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى It is revelation that is being sent down to him that he is reciting to you. And this is <coughs> important. Because the Prophet wasallam neither made mistakes, he did not lie to the people, he did not misguide the people, and he did not make things up about his own accord. He did not speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this religion, Without being instructed to do so. Without instruction. He would not do that. And so actually a very interesting hadith about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that which he would say. Abdullah bin Amr bin Al-As used to say عنه, that I would write down everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say. And so the Quraysh would come to him and say, do you write down everything? What if he's you know, saying something, just making things up? He's mad, he's upset, he gets heated, he gets emotional, he lets his anger get the best of him. How could you write all of this stuff down and think of it as religion? And so, I went to the Prophet wasallam and I mentioned this to him, and he said, he pointed to his mouth and he said, Uktub, write, فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي that By the one whom my soul is in his hand. Swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. مَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ إِلَّا حَقٌ That nothing exits from here. Meaning, I don't say anything except for the truth. So even when I'm angry or I'm extremely happy or sad, no matter, no, no matter what my emotional state is, okay, no matter where I am, if I'm joking or not joking, it doesn't matter. The only thing that comes out of these lips is the truth. So write as you want. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after testifying to the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he describes the one that's bringing down this revelation to him. And he starts to talk about Jibreel alayhi salam. Right? Allamahu shadeedul quwa. He was taught to the one that he was taught by the one of amazing strength, intense in strength. And the Prophet ﷺ actually mentions that during the Isra and Mi'raj, he actually gets to see Jibreel alayhi salam. He said, Allah says, adna. He was so close to Jibreel. About a bow or two lengths, or even lower, closer. And he said that the Prophet ﷺ said while he was at a distance, a two or bow closer, he said, 
Ibn Mas'ud informed me that the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel and he had 600 wings. So the Prophet ﷺ at the Isra and Mi'raj got to see Jibreel ﷺ in his true, immense, extreme form. And we know that Jibreel is the greatest angel of all of the angels. Right? He's the one that's in charge of revelation. And this is an important duty and it is an honor for Jibreel to be bestowed with that duty. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after describing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his truthfulness and Jibreel alayhi salam, now he begins to criticize the Quraysh. And in the 19th and 20th verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes them and he says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَمَنَاتَ ثَالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى that you have these idols of Allah and Al Uzza, Alakum Dhakaru Walahul Untha. Why is it that you for you you have these male and for him the female? Tilka idan qismatun driza, then that is an unjust division. Now Ibn Jarir radhiallahu he mentions that they derived Allah's name. This is his theory. Allah's name as a feminine form of Allah. And then Uzza, deriving it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name, Al-Aziz. And so the Quraysh, remember, even though they would worship these different idols, they still believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem is they did not worship Him alone. They believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say, who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they directed their worship to other than him, to idols. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes in the 27th verse. He says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ لَيُسَمُّونَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تَسْمِيَةَ الْأُنْثَى Indeed, those who do not believe in the hereafter, they give the angels these feminine names. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times throughout the Qur'an criticized them for attacking him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his angels. Sometimes even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that they, uh, they claim that, you know, there are some theologies out there that claim like the angels, if you know this or not, that the angels are the daughters of God, they say. And all of these weird things that they say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, cra- is criticizing them. And he says, مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ They have no knowledge. They only follow that which is their conjecture, their assumptions, these things that they have made up. And these different assumptions that they have, they do not remove any of the truth at all. They do not affect the truth even one ounce. And so turn away from whoever turns his back on our message and desires only this worldly life and not the hereafter. <clears throat> then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Sidrat al-Muntaha. He mentions that, uh, that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to Sidrat al-Muntaha. Some of the things mentioned in the surah describe the events of the Isra and Mi'raj. And Sidrat al-Muntaha is the... Uh, Highest level, highest creation, right? The literal highest creation. And the only thing above that is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes in the 32nd verse and he mentions something interesting that I, I wanted to point out here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a unique characteristic of the righteous, those who are righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alladheena yet. There are those who avoid the major sins and evil things except for al-lamam. So there are those who, the righteous, who are those who avoid major sinning and evil things except for al-lamam. And al-lamam is a phrase or reference to like the minor sins. Hmm? And so the righteous people are those who do not engage in the major sins, right? Theft, zina, murder. 
But they do allamam, the minor sins. And this is a beautiful verse in terms of hoping good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is not a single person that is perfect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here describes these imperfect people. And it's important that when we commit these major, the, these minor, even major sins, but even when we commit minor sins as well, that we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't fall into the, even the minor sins continuously. Sometimes, unfortunately, we have like this, uh, this notion that if it's not a major sin, I don't mind engaging in this minor sin. You know, it's just a small problem, right? And in fact, the scholars, they would always say, don't look at the size of the sin, but look at the greatness of the one who you are sinning against. Don't look at the size of the sin that you're committing, but look at the greatness of the one whom you are sinning against. So, you are sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make sure that you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even from these allamam, even from these minor sins. So then, and so then in the 33rd verse, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets up a series of rhetorical questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim الذي تولى, have you seen the one who turned away? And he gave little and then he held back. Does he have knowledge of the unseen? And so, but he can see. Has he not been informed of what was in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim? And that no one will bear the burdens of another soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these verses. There's a story after the battle of Badr of a man named Walid bin Mughira. Okay. And this man was someone who fought against the Muslims, but he had an inclination towards Islam. He had many interactions with the Prophet وسلم, and he recognized the truthfulness of it. And so he comes, it's, it's narrated that he had decided to start practicing Islam. And one of his friends mocked him, chastised him for it. And so then he said, <clears throat> pay me, right? And he said, why did you follow this religion actually? So he said, look, I'm afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. So the man said, give me some money, right? And I will take the punishment from Allah for you. Okay, so therefore you live your life as you're living it, that you want to. Give me the money and on the day of judgment, I'll stand before God on your, in your favor and he can punish me instead of you. Right? And so he made a payment to him. And the man said, no, pay me some more after that. Right? It's like a subscription service, I guess. You know? Uh, and he said, no. Right? And he turned away from doing that. And so this man was Walid bin Mughira. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals these verses. You see the one who has turned away. Right? This man had come to Islam, decided to practice it, and then left. Does he not know that Allah tazir that no person will hand, hold or be held accountable for other people's sins on that day or their burdens? So you can't pay people to do good deeds for you. You can't pay people to take the sin from you. It's not possible, right? And so this is obviously ridiculous silliness, but still this is something that happened, and so Allah subhanahu wa taala calls it out. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the 50th verse and he continues uh, he describes and has a, you know, a series of different things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala events that he's talking about some miraculous nature such as birth and do you not see this and that and all these uh, that we've done for you all uh, <clears throat> does he not see the one who is turned away does he not see the proofs of Islam such as we have created humanity from a drop and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gives life and it has death, or, or that gives death, I should say. Gives life and takes, takes it. And then he created male and he created female. And that, you know, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gives and He takes. And He is the one who is the Lord of everything. And did you not see the people like Ad and Thamud and Nuh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next surah, in Surah Al Qamar, which we've already talked about, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their people as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is setting this up for the next surah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we get to the 60th verse, He says, And yet you see all of these things. And you laugh instead of weeping. You are laughing instead of crying. While you are walking around proud. Right? Boasting. So instead, prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship Him. And when the Quraysh heard this verse, like that, they all fell into sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the power of these verses. But this is an incredibly beautiful, powerful surah that describes the Day of Judgment, it describes the truthfulness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa describes the miraculous nature of Isra and Mi'raj, it talks about the righteous people, and it describes an incident that they see with their own eyes with Walid bin Mughira, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his case and he says, don't you see this and that, all of these things that you see in front of yourself, and you know Islam is the truth, and you're walking around laughing and smiling and proud, Instead of crying, well, instead of doing all that, instead you just do sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship Him. And them falling to sujood in, if, of, in and of itself is also a sign of their testimony to the fact that this is the truth. Their own testimony to the fact that this is the truth. And yet, they still deny. And because of it, they will be punished. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us humble to recognize the truth as truth and He guides us to it and that we are those who are have the vision and the clarity that He guides us to seeing the falsehood as falsehood and that we stay away from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us those who humble themselves in this life so that He may grant us higher levels of Jannah in the afterlife. Allahumma ameen wa sallillahu wa barakatuh alayhi Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'een wa jazakallah khair wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.